So my name is uh, Linda Worley. I am the Associate Dean for Graduate Studies in the Faculty of Arts. And I'm also the chair of the Three Minute Thesis Organizing Committee here at the University of Waterloo. I'd like to pre uh, introduce you to the other speakers you'll be hearing from today um, and some of our team members who make this whole competition happen. And I'll g give you a brief outline of what's going to happen in this coaching session today. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Tasha Glover, who works in the Graduate Studies office. And she's the one who makes everything happen. Right, so she's the one who runs the website and or organizes all of us to do all the faculty level heats and all the advertising and all of that. And Tasha is fantastic. So thank you very much, Tasha. Beside her is Angela Rook, um, who is the manager of the Graduate Professional Skills and Postdoctoral Affairs Office at the uh, University of Waterloo, also situated in the Graduate Students Office and is very involved uh, with various initiatives that are going on um, at the University of Waterloo to help doctoral students in particular and postdoctoral fellows, but really any graduate students, think about their careers after school, after you get your degrees. And this competition is part of that initiative. Uh, following my introductory remarks, you'll be hearing from Sue Grant, who works in the office of Right, organization and human development who will be doing some coaching specifically about presentation, public presentation um, skills. After that, you'll be hearing from Dr. Amy Morrison, who is uh, a digital media specialist and also graduate officer in the Department of English Language and Literature. And she'll be talking to you about how to make the most of your PowerPoint slide. And finally, you will hear from somebody who's been through this and was the runner-up in last year's competition, and that's Ayla Jabbar, who also just handed in her PhD dissertation like half an hour ago. <laughs> okay, so the three-minute thesis competition, this is the fourth year that the University of Waterloo has participated in this competition. Um, and it's really my fault. I was the one who brought it to the University of Waterloo because I heard about it at the annual meeting of the Canadian Association of Graduate Studies. And I got very excited about this because one of the things that I've been very uh, concerned with is the number of graduate students in Canada who are graduating with advanced degrees and then not necessarily having an immediate sense of what they might do with their education if they do not go on into academia. So I thought this would be a wonderful opportunity uh, for those uh, students at Waterloo competing um, in this competition to develop some professional skills and in particular public speaking skills. Um, it also, because you have to compress uh, what your research is about in a three minute period, it really helps you explain to people outside of the university what your research is about and why it matters. And by people, I mean like your girlfriend, your grandmother, people at a dinner party, whatever, right? We all have that conversation. We've all had those moments where people say, so what are you working on? And you start to tell them and you see their eyes glaze over, <laughs> right? So this will give you an opportunity to be able to articulate really you know, succinctly and effectively why your research matters. So the competition started in Australia. It's a branded competition, so we have to play by the rules, and I'm going to go over those in a moment. Uh, but it's really caught on, and it's now nationwide in Canada. So the, the finalist um, who participates um, at, here at the University of Waterloo finals will then go on to the provincial finals. So Ontario um, has a provincial finals because there are so many Ontario universities. But we now, for the second year in a row, uh, will have a national competition. So there will be uh, people competing uh, for the top honors uh, across the country. So it's really grown and it's really exciting. And I really am so happy to see all of you here. And congratulations on signing up for this. Because although you might be kind of nervous right now, trust me, the experience of it is really valuable. And actually, the competition is a lot of fun. Plus, there's money to be won, right? There are <laughs> prizes. And, you know, food. They'll, they'll give you food at some point and things like that. <laughs> OK, so I'm just going to go over. Those, that's it for my introductory remarks. And I'm just going to go over the rules. And then we'll give you some actual coaching on how to do your best job. OK, so 
The first rule is you have one, you're speaking, but you have one static PowerPoint slide. The, and by static, we mean there can be no animations, no GIFs, no sound clips, no YouTube videos, nothing. It is just a static slide. The slide will be behind you, like a PowerPoint presentation like this, the entire time that you were talking. So you could refer to it, or you could just have it there as a backdrop. No additional electronic media can be used. So you can't have anything recorded on your cell phone, for instance, that you want uh, to use. And you can't have any additional props. Um, later, I'm sure somebody's going to ask me what you should wear, and I'll happily uh, answer that. But really, the thing is here, you can't dress up in, in costume, right? And you can't you know, have funny jingly hat or anything like that. The three minutes is a firm deadline. There will be a counter, and you'll be able to see it. But when you're preparing, you should really be aiming to really hit that three-minute mark. Because if you go over three minutes, you'll be disqualified. And that's a really firm rule. Next slide, please. OK. Uh, again, it's to be spoken word. Now, spoken word in my discipline could mean spoken word poetry. But that's not actually what we're talking about. I'm an English professor, too. So it means that you are standing up here like this, giving a presentation in your normal voice. You are not singing it or doing interpretive dance. Um, this timer, the clock, will start as soon as you move on to the stage and make some introductory gesture. It could be a body movement or it could be your voice, but that is the moment when the clock will start. Okay, so you have to be very conscious of what you're doing with your body. Um, and presentations must be made by memory. You can't have notes with you. Uh, no, not on any device, not on an index card, not on, written on the back of your hand. Right? You have to just memorize it and be able to speak it from memory. The language is English. Uh, Quebec has its own parallel com uh, competition, but the language for the 3MT for us is English. And there will be a panel of judges who score your presentations, and their decisions are final. Okay? And I think that's it for me. Right. So now I'd like you to introduce uh, Sue Grant, who will give you some more specific information about really good preparation strategies. So I'm really happy to be here right now. <laughs> How many people believe me? I have a mic. Do, is my mic not working? This one, that's this one is easy. You didn't hear me say I was happy to be here? That, no. That one is okay. Computer. Okay. This one is for your voice. No, I have, I have this one. Yeah, so just keep, take that one for your voice to be out of the way. But she's wearing But I'm wearing one. But it's one. not working as well. Okay, so it's not working. Here we go. So how many people believe me? The, your presentation is more than just the words that you write down. And um, so briefly today we're going to be talking about how we typically prepare for giving a presentation. And you might spend a lot of time sitting at your computer thinking about what words you're going to say. But this is, this is a contact sport. You've got to get in the water. You've got you to feel it. You've got to practice it. So the idea of experiential learning is, one, to sign up and, and enter into this three-minute thesis competition so that you can gain this experience. And then um, practice and set, like, what, what do I want to gain from this? What, what are my goals? Um, how am I going to stretch myself? How many people, when you're preparing for the three-minute thesis, are thinking, um, I'm preparing for this to gain impact and to win this competition? How many people? I love you. Yeah, this is good. The, uh, my, so after I speak here for 10 minutes, my goal is that everyone's going to put their hand up. They're going to enter this to win. And you're, it, Because what's the mindset if I said, OK, how many people are entering this to lose? Hands up. You know. the, the idea is, what message are you saying to yourself? How are you preparing for this? And then also, when you do win, 
and you are going to win, when you do win, that you're not shocked and petrified that now I have to go to the next level and the next level. So the idea of preparing to win and, and playing big, not playing small and trying to protect yourself. The idea is be a little bit vulnerable so that people can um, reach out and help you with, with this, uh, this competition. So the, what, what I've prepared today, and, and this is also going to be available online, is some strategies, to strategies and behaviors to, to really highlight um, how you can grow as an effective communicator through this experience and how it will really change you know, how you're preparing for beyond your, your degree. Communication skills, they really transcend most career paths. How you can negotiate, how you can persuade, how you can excite people about the work you're going to do. So the three categories that I'm planning to share with you are knowing the why behind the message, planning for the what, what information is important, and then practicing the how. So in terms of the why, why is your research and the broader and deeper understanding of your research important to you? Why are you doing this thesis? I want you to just find someone in the room. Um, could be someone you know, even better, someone you don't know. And I'm going to give you two minutes and just talk about why is your research important to you? I'll give you two minutes. See, once I get people going on their research, they just don't want to stop, which is a good... Okay, now, the, now these are... Are they too many mics? Not enough? That's better? Okay. Thank you. It's always the techno, technical side. So the, this was the beginnings of the, the why behind it. And in terms of um, getting to the emotional side of why this is important to you. Because that's what you're going to project in this three-minute thesis. You're going to bring out the energy and the, and, and the importance of it. Talk to as many people as you can. That was about two minutes. So continue these conversations, maybe even with people that don't have that same clarity of understanding. You're going to be preparing this talk for the audience, not for you. You're preparing it for what's in it for them. Why is this, your research, important to the people in the room and drawing them in? You want to pull them towards you, not push them. So that, that energy. So the why is a really good starting factor and knowing it for yourself. And this is going to help you uh, give one to get the energy to get up every morning and read and work in the lab or whatever, whatever you're, you're accomplishing in, in your, your thesis. But it's also going to help prepare you for the defense of, of this. How, how you're looking for the why behind it, the impact of it. So continue these messages. The, the second category is the what. What information is important? And in terms of the what, this is about prioritizing. Remember, it's the three-minute thesis. That doesn't mean speak for three minutes as quickly as you can with everything you want me to know. So it's trying to prioritize your work. It, it's almost the three-point thesis, trying to make sure what's the impact. What do you want people to be saying and doing after you finish your talk? So start with the end in mind as you're preparing for this in terms of your what's the core to your message. It, it's important to intrigue rather than inundate. I'm hoping that after this 10-minute talk, you're going to go and research more about effective presentation. You're going to be intrigued by how can I get better and better and better at communicating. So the idea of avoiding too much information. It was, and I don't, maybe Linda can help me with this too. Hemingway wrote six words. I don't know the validity of this, but six words, a story with six words. 
And the six words were, baby shoes for sale, never worn. So the idea of the intrigue and the captivation in what your message is, you don't have to tell them the whole punchline. You have to draw them in. And after the talk, they're going to come up and say, can you tell me a little bit more about that? I'm, I'm excited about your research. So thinking about that in terms of what you want to do, you want to make connections with examples. The, the work you do has a complexity and a sophistication to it. But knowing your audience, that's why just touching and as, as Linda talked about, um, talking to other people about this, they'll look at you and, and turn their head like, I, I have no idea what you're talking. So then you can start keep on practicing how you can bring it into their world. These are going to be very intelligent individuals in the audience, but they might not know as much as you do. So you know, how can you bring it and make them feel that they're leaving the room smarter? Like that, that's really what this, this does. It energizes people and think they, they do know a little bit more. Um, so you, when, you're, when you're bringing connections, some examples that I have are um, my, my daughter plays ringette. So I can go on and talk about ringette, but the people in the room that have never heard it before would quickly lose interest. So then I can say that it, it's a sport um, that is similar to hockey that's played on an ice rink. So people that are already familiar with hockey will kind of plod along with me with this understanding. People that don't understand hockey, um, might, I might say it's similar to basketball too because it has a shot clock. So each team has a possession for not 24 seconds like in basketball, but 30 seconds. And if you, if you don't shoot by the time the, the shot clock goes, then you lose possession. So I'm bringing this, this analogy of trying to communicate something that's unfamiliar to you, ringette, to something that's familiar with you. And that, that's uh, when you're listening to people give these presentations, try to pick up what analogies and metaphors they do use and so that it, it draws in the reader. The, the other example I had was um, Steve Jobs, right, back in 2001 when the iPod came out, he talked about the amount of memory was like having a thousand songs in, his po in your pocket. People could relate to that. They, they understood. It was, was less familiar with what the capacity of this is, so that story. So ensure that you build that in, in terms of the what. The last component is the how. Remember, the, the messenger is the message. Your, your energy to this, your credibility behind this is going to be part of the message. So the how is really important. Um, and the how is, is really what comes out when you practice. Researchers in communication really align good presenters with those that are more conversational. So that's why a, a really good practice tip is to practice your presentation by just talking to someone. And then remember how that conversation felt when you actually do it. So you don't feel that, you're, that the, the audience isn't here and I'm just saying the words that I want to say so that I say them and then they're done. Like you're, you're connecting. You're making eye contact with certain people in the audience. You're head nodding. Your voice and your pace are aligned with how people think. Silence is a heavy lifter. Now, it's three minutes, so you, you want to use silence sparingly. But silence brings a little bit of that emotion. So practicing that as well in your, um, in your talk. Um, the other um, part is the energy how much excitement you have, and also how you prepare for the anxiety that is associated with speaking publicly. And this is speaking publicly. So you are, you are vulnerable. I know it's only three minutes, but practicing how you're going to get your heart rate down. 
That's your breathing. Practicing how confident you're going to be. That's how you hold your body. And, and so that you're not stiff, you're not tight. You're not in a, in a position where you're really projecting this nervousness. And that comes with, with not only practice, but watching other people too and seeing what styles they, they have. And then it starts with how I started in terms of wanting to win this. And everyone will have their own definition of winning. Obviously, the, the winning is that the judges are going to select you. But I'm talking really about being proud of yourself, the self-talk that you, you, you say to yourself in terms of this presentation. That's a part of this, too. Entice or bring in your supervisors and your, your friends uh, within your lab groups to help them build your confidence, too. This is, uh, this is part of your know-how, but you're, you're really building your confidence so that when you are giving more and more presentations as you, as you continue your career, that you feel that this is, this is something that really has helped you grow. So we're all behind you. We, we hope that everyone has much success. And I believe that the success is signing up in terms of really putting yourself out there and making a commitment to, to doing this. So I wish you all the best. Thank you. Oh, I'm supposed to introduce Amy Morrison. All right, so I'm going to show you a slide provided by Edward Tufte in his analysis of the 2003 Challenger space shuttle crash called PowerPoint Does Rocket Science. Okay, so while the shuttle was in orbit, engineers on the ground tried to determine what kind of damage it might have sustained when a 700 gram chunk of foam insulation hit the wing during takeoff. So Boeing prepared this slide here. So it is emblematic of terrible slides everywhere, okay? It's jargony, it has false hierarchies embedded in it, um, it has sloppy language use, and it's of an arbitrary length, which is they wrote as much text as would fit on the slide and then stopped writing, okay? Um, so what happened is the engineers were using this slide to figure out what they could do while everybody was in space to make sure everybody came back alive, and then the shuttle exploded. So, <laughs> your slide is not doing rocket science unless rocket science is your field but probably no fatal accidents will result from bad slide design. So everybody just take a breath. It's not that serious, right? Okay. Which is not to say that bad slides are good, but it's probably not going to be intergalactic explosions related to it, but also to say that even very smart people can make very terrible slides. So do not let your intelligence fool you into thinking that you already know what you're doing because these people thought that they were knew what they were doing. Um, so, I teach new media design and I'm going to have us consider the slide as a rhetorical graphical object, right? It is persuasive and it is made of pictures. So let's think about how to use that picture space. So graphics can do a bunch of things. Illustration, right? So like the 3MT template, an illustration is something nice to look at or it can provide a visual identity or it can set a mood. It is decorative or pictorial. A slide using this strategy might show a bicycle for a study on uh, urban design, for example. A diagram. A diagram explains concepts visually. Um, so it lays out a series of steps to get from condition A to condition B. So a sociology dissertation might diagram a process for smoking cessation um, in support of seniors who've been smoking for a very long time, for example. Quantitative data. So your slide might present results like tables or bar graphs or pie charts. So maybe a computer science dissertation has shaved some tiny fraction of time off some super essential multiply repeated routine uh, and you want to show the testing data for that possibly. Analysis. Um, so analysis and causality puts the component parts into a relationship or describes a process. This is really hard to do. This is like a next level maneuver if you want to do that. Um, so a rhetoric student might use a combination of text and image to link cause and effect as Tufty did with the annotation on the Boeing slide that I showed you, right? Um, or integration. 
So um, graphics uses integration, pulls things together, right? Pulls together the parts to create a new whole. And so I'll show you that example as we proceed. So the slide is to your presentation as a tennis racket is to Eugenie Bouchard, right? Um, it's possible, it's an, ex it's an essential extension of your capacity to act. So it's possible to imagine a scenario in which people like Serena Williams is like serving to you and you put your hand out and hit it back, but it's probably not going to work. That's a different sport called handball. Um, and if you're using one of those like wooden rackets with the tiny sweet spot, maybe you can hit the serve, but you're not actually going to do anything important with it. So think of that tennis racket and your slide as serving the same purpose. Um, okay, so don't throw your slide away on something purely decorative. It might look pretty, but you're competing against people whose slides are going to have real substantive information on them. Um, so rise to the rhetorical occasion of the three-minute thesis. The exigence is to convince a room of strangers that your thesis is really interesting and that they understand what it's about and that you are super clever. No biggie, right? Um, so you probably have two main problems to start with. So first, maybe you don't think your project is either clever or interesting and that, that's right. Everybody's like, too true. <laughs> Is this therapy? Uh, and second, maybe you think there's no way you can make it fit on one slide or three minutes of talk or both. So I'm here to tell you, you're just completely wrong. You're just totally wrong because all of those things are in fact possible to do, all right? So, any of you know this Tumblr? Lol, my thesis. Um, so doctoral candidates write one sentence um, that's an informal and vernacular summary of their thesis project. They are hilarious and impressive. And I have hauled out three of them for you. Um, one from information science, one from zoology, and one from classics. Just to show you, this is not a disciplinary thing. It's good you're all smiling now. This is better than my class this morning. Can you all come to my class <laughs> next week and smile? Um, okay, so please note particularly the difference in tone between the thesis title and the summary. Okay, so people get lost and then not. Thanks, Google Maps, all right. So that's from Information Science, and here's the actual title. Informational Practices in Urban Spaces, Portraits of Transnational Newcomers, okay. <laughs> Presented without comment. All right, you ready for the next one? Yeah, you are? Okay, cool shave. Infanticide sometimes happens in Greek tragedy because Athenian men were afraid of ladies in Smurf hats. <laughs> Do you like not totally want to read that thesis now? <laughs> when is the last time you saw somebody's thesis described and thought, man, I got to read that? OK. So that's classical studies. <laughs> and I love this. This has the Ron Burgundy in the title here. Well, that escalated quickly. Infanticide and duality in Euripides' Medea as an expression of Athenian anxieties in 431 BC. OK, that's still pretty cool. I'm not like going to race out and buy that, though. All right. So here's the third one. We probably ate most of the mammoths. <laughs> Mystery solved. All right, so that's zoology. Uh, climate or colonization, a quantitative global analysis of humans and climate in explaining late quaternary megafaunal extinctions. The only way you can have fun with that particular title is if you go to the dentist first and try to say it before the freezing comes out. Good times. All right. So it is possible to take anybody's thesis and turn it into something that can make a room full of nervous people laugh, right? If they can do that, then surely you can create an interesting slide, right? All right, so that's the title of my dissertation. I'm not gonna leave that on a slide because it's boring. Even though it gets to the point in a pretty economical way, it totally reads like a dissertation title, which is not the genre you're working in, right? So my thesis is about popular rather than expert understanding of computers. So maybe I could use a picture instead. Is that working? Uh, no, because clip art is never appropriate. <laughs> if you write down one thing, that's what you write down. Never clip art. Um, OK, how about something historical? OK, well, I start my thesis by talking about the first post-war computers, but I don't think so, because that's not actually the main point of my thesis, um, which happens to be about the 1980s. So I can't really figure out what to put on my slide until I can really distill the essence of what my dissertation argues. 
So for what it's worth, it's actually really hard to write a good dissertation if you can't describe it in three minutes and say something sensible. So <laughs> this is a really good exercise to do at the ends of your degrees when you're having to figure out how to do an elevator pitch. But it's also really good to do this at the start of your degree when you don't even know how to describe your thesis in anything less than seven paragraphs, to which I say good luck writing from that outline. Yikes. So anyhow. <sighs> to win, you've got to move beyond sensible, sensible is what we start from, through engaging and into fascinating. So, and you have to do that without losing the information quality. So the LOL versions um, that we looked at were fascinating, but a little too jokey for what we want to do here. And my clip art had the same problem, right? So there's lots of ways to work on being fascinating, many of which other speakers are addressing for you today. So one way to do this is to lull your thesis as a first step towards distilling it to the essence and then building a slide out after that. So can I, so my thesis was nearly 300 pages long and that was at one and a half line spacing, not even double spacing. So is it possible for me to describe it in a tweet length statement? Yep. In the 50s and 60s, no one owned computers. Now everyone does. How would that happen? That's pretty good. I could also say, computers used to terrify everyone. Now they don't. How would that happen? Or, computers used to be for scientists and villains, and now they're for everybody. How would that happen? So those are all pretty good descriptions of what I talk about in my thesis, but I can't do all of those things. I can't be like, I'm going to do one minute on this, and one minute on that, and one minute on the other. No, I have to pick one. So that's the one I'm going to pick. I'm interested in how computers became something that regular people used. And now I have to figure out how to do a slide that's going to help me tell that story, right? So this breaks my heart to have to limit it like this, but it must be done. So designing your slide. I don't have any quantitative or qualitative data in my dissertation, so I'm not going to have a diagram or a chart or a table. My dissertation is about the stories in popular culture, so my slide is going to use illustrations from those primary texts um, to analyze them and then integrate the bits of my argument in a way that gives a sense of what the whole thing did in a way that people can understand. So I'll start, I think, with one big picture. And so you'll notice the question on this picture kind of replicates the question that I asked when I lulled my thesis, right? So the, quest, um, the picture shows that this was actually a real question in the 80s, because this is an ad from the 80s, and it's saying, what kind of man owns his own personal computer? I don't know. What kind of man owns his own personal computer? And do ladies own them? Who knows? Um, so my thesis actually argues that people answered that question in three distinct ways. So I think I'm going to stick in three more pictures to show the three ways. So first, we started to see computers as the future for everyone, but especially for children. So there's a lot of advertisements with a lot of kids in them, and the computers are always like on coffee tables or next to couches, or what's really hilarious is when you get the ads that have those giant computers like on somebody's bed. <laughs> That's a good way to start a bedding fire, actually. They don't call them laptops, eh, because you break your legs holding onto those. Um, okay, so I want to show how there's a lot of like middle class white people in houses using computers. So I'm going to do that. And then my other thing, it's like everybody needs more Christopher Walken, right? So in the, in the 80s, everybody did think nuclear war and dystopian devastation was just around the corner. So there were still lots of computer villains, actually, and a lot of anxiety about computers bringing about the end of the world. But the way you defeated computer villains was by making giant computer headsets and being Christopher Walken. Um, so that was new and interesting. If computers were the problem, computers were also the answer. And then my third thing is, we turn computers into adorable, huggable things in movies with Steve Gutenberg. So that's, anybody know the movie? Short it's Short Circuit, yeah. I highly recommend that you watch it. Um, if you haven't, you're all just pretending you don't know what it is. I know that. Um, okay, so we had fuzzy fantasies about machines saving us from ourselves. So this is a movie about a robot who teaches engineers to love hippies and stop warmongering and start hugging. That's the third 1980s story about what we could do with computers and what kind of man would own one. Okay, So that's my slide then. Obviously, I can't go through it picture by picture the way I just did, but I could put it up here and begin by saying this is my main question in my dissertation. And in my dissertation, I've discovered that in the 1980s, popular culture answered that question in three 
different ways. And each of those pictures um, is an occasion to hang a chunk of my argument on in a way that is both visually appealing to people and is kind of gripping and a mnemonic. So that if you leave after here and I ask you, what are the three kinds of ways we talked about computers in the 80s, probably you'd be able to tell me. You just, I just taught you my dissertation. Yes! It's good that somebody's getting something out of it. Um, okay, so um, note here how the main picture is bigger. This is a kind of graphical argument where we take the most important thing and you put it in pride of place. So normally it's bigger or it's to the left or it's in the middle, right? That's the visual language for most important or where you start. The other things, I've made them roughly the same size and roughly the same distance apart because here I'm trying to show that those three argument strands are equivalent. So I've made the three pictures visually equivalent there as well. I've avoided having weird, giant, trapped white space here. People don't like that. They look in the holes. I haven't made anything bigger than the proportional importance it takes up in what I'm trying to say. And all of my photos have roughly the same resolution. I would say have a look at your slide actually projected before you use it because sometimes people combine different images and one of them comes out looking super duper pixelated and the other one looks great and you might not notice that until you project it and that kind of looks like I don't know what the technical term for that face is but it looks like <laughs> right so make sure everything is roughly the same resolution so for your slide then remember you can provide an illustration diagram a process present your data perform analysis, or integrate the parts into a whole. So don't create your slide until you can lull your thesis down to one clear statement. Then build up the text of your presentation and the content of your slide at the same time so that they'll work together. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ella Hejabari. I'm the runner of the, of the last year competition. Uh, we have had many good talks today. I'm just want to share some of my experiences from last year with you, not repeating the uh, many good uh, notes that we had before. First of all, it's my motivation to participate in this competition last year. Actually, I found that the, the best thing for me was that because of the nature of the competition, it's a competition, it's fun, it's like a game. So let's play a game, let's have fun together, and it's better than just, again, sitting in your office or working in the lab. You have now time to be out of your lab, out of your office, think about your research, work on it, and uh, just introduce your research to somebody who doesn't have any idea about your research. It's time to advertise your research, to think about your research, and get some good idea from other students, other faculty members in the university. So let's, let's try it and enjoy it and learn and have fun. Uh, let's practice some public speak or public presentation. It's so important. We, uh, we have to do something like this in future. When you got a job, you get a job, you have to do it. So let's try it right now. And it's good to make some relationship with other students, other faculty members, supervisors, with Tasha. Very good. <laughs> yes. Now I'm going to just talk about the steps that you are going to go through for uh, preparation. First of all, you need to pre prepare your three-minute talks, uh, making one static slide and practice over and over. I'm saying just preparing your three-minute talk before making your slide. I understand that the deadline for submitting your slide to Tasha is a few days before the competition, but make sure that you have already prepared your talk. Don't allow your slide to change the thing that you are going to talk about. First, think about your thesis, the thing that you are doing. Prepare your talk, your three minutes talk, and then make your slide based on the thing that you are going to talk about. Or at least do them simultaneously. When you are preparing your talk, just prepare uh, your slide as well. And after that, you need to practice a random. I'm going to talk about this part again. Uh, in your three-minute talk, you want to make sure that your three-minute talk is as exciting and informative as possible. 
is just three minutes? You want to, in three minutes, show people that why you are so passionate about your work, why you are so excited about what you are doing. And remember that your audience is a lay audience. To do that, you need to find a correlation between your work and a bigger issue in the world. Let's say if everything goes well with your work, what's going to be changed in the world? Nothing? What about in 10 years? What about in 20 years? Even 100 years, researchers are following around, uh, along from you. What about the 100 years? Something has to be changed through your research. Find that issue in the world and talk about that issue first. After that, talk about the ways that we can solve the issue. And at the end, talk about the way that you are, the work that you are doing to solve this issue. In the third part, just focus on the most interesting part of your research. Not from your perspective, from perspective of a novice. Your audience is a lay audience. So, Find the most interesting part of your research. Lift yourselves up, get a helicopter view of what you are doing during your research. Find the issue that you are going to solve through your research. Talk about that issue. Talk about the way that you can solve the issue and the, the thing that you are specifically doing to solve this issue. And on this part, talk about the most interesting part of your issue. Sometimes you know everything about your research. You know many good things, all the details about, you, uh, about your research. But you don't know how you can just explain your research to somebody who doesn't have any idea about your research. It means that you are suffering from course of knowledge. So you have to improve it. You know everything. You have all the knowledge, but you don't know what's like not to have this knowledge. So you need to work on this part. How? Just talk about your research with people who have absolutely no idea about your research. Talk about your research with your parents, your siblings. And if it's possible, just tape yourself, just tape the conversation on your phone. After that, you'll find yourself talking about the sort of things and find that moment that they are excited about your work. Focus on that part and talk about just that part of your research because you just have three minutes. For making your slide, it's one static slide, no transition, no animation, no sound, nothing. It sounds hard and it is hard, yes. It takes time. So before the deadline for submitting your slide, make sure that you have enough time because you know that first you have to think about your research, prepare your talk, and then making the slide, which is hard. So make sure that you have enough time to do that. In your slide, just use simple images. The image doesn't have to be necessarily from your work, your own research, your own results. You can use a funny, simple image. It's, it's important that to have simple image as the image that you have in this slide. And also use simple forms. If you have uh, some text in your slide, just use simple forms. And just as a tip, um, choose one of the most impactful, uh, simple photos of your research or related to your research, which we call it hero shoot, and put it in the middle of your slide. You can, in the middle or to the left, as Amy said, you can put nothing around it, some text around it to support it, or some other images about the issue, about other ways, about your research, around it to support this hero shoot. For example, in my slide, it's my, my slide for last year, um, my research is going to result in having foldable cell phone in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, nobody knows. Foldable cell phone. I've put the foldable cell phone in the middle, so now everybody knows that I'm going to talk about foldable cell phones. My, my research is about foldable cell phones. I've put some images, for example, about the issue that we currently have with, 
with these cell phones or tablets that we have, and some images about the material and also the fabrication method, 3D printing that I'm using in my research to, to get to the foldable cell phones and tablets, something like that. So find these this impactful images which is related to your work, not necessarily from your work, just make sure that you have permission to use all the figures that you have in your slide. And at the end, just some tips. First of all, just try to memorize your speech. It's just three minutes. You don't have time to, to just think about the word that you are going to say. You don't have time to change any word. One word counts. So just try to memorize it. But after memorizing, you need to practice it over and over. Just practice it several times. And for practicing, you just need to have eye contact because having somebody in front of you and having eye contact with you can strongly affect your presentation. So your practice, in, during your practice, you have to have somebody in front of you. I know that you can't hire somebody for three, four days to be in front of you. You just need two eyes. It can be dull eyes maybe. I use my daughter's dolls to do that because I didn't have anybody to be in front of me for three days and for practice. You know, I can borrow, borrow them to you if you want. I have many dolls at home, yes. Just make sure that you have two eyes in front of you when you are practicing. Use, you, you need to have some hand gestures, natural ones. Use the stage naturally. You don't need to walk on the stage. Just use some spaces around you uh, naturally. Also, be confident and relax. Even if you make mistakes, that, that's fine. We all make mistakes, and we learn through our mistakes. It's nothing to be ashamed of. So just be relaxed, have fun, learn, and best of luck for you all. Thank you. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions, which I'm happy to take and try and answer. And for, questions not just for me, but for anyone. Yes? How do you get permission to use photos? Copyright, very important. Um, okay, I wasn't here last year. What, how did we, did we resolve that? You have to secure copyright, but you don't have to put the information on the slide. Is that right? That in the title slide. Yeah. Is that only a one static slide? Uh, can I put the title slide? The title slide is just has your what is your name, the thesis title, and any copyright information. That will be on the screen before you begin your presentation. The moment you begin your presentation, your PowerPoint slide will be behind you. Yeah, so, so I should be preparing by myself, right? Yes. Yeah, they, and you will submit that um, when you submit your other slide. Okay. Yeah. So two, two slides. Right. One is the informational slide or the introduction with your name, and the other one is the rhetorical slide that Professor Morrison was talking about. Yeah. No, oh, nothing on the title slide. That is just plain blank, and it's a template that you'll fill out. Okay. Yeah. Uh, will there be a section of questions after the presentation? No. It's not an audience participation event. It's a competition. Yeah. I mean, you can, obviously, you can talk to people afterwards. If you make it to the finals, one of the things that we have done is while the judges are out of the room, uh, we open it up to the audience to ask questions or to engage with you just to fill in that time. But f when you're competing in your faculty heats, it'll be one after another. Yeah. Oh, uh, the judging criteria, are, it's on the website, right? So the, there is information for the judges on the Three Minute Thesis website. So, I mean, I could try and remember, but the accurate sort of information will be there. Okay, there's actually a lot of information on the, um, uh, the Three Minute Thesis website, which is hosted on the GSO website. Yeah? Do we know who the judges will be? 
No, uh, we, you won't know in advance, but we ask people to judge and they are usually, for the faculty heats, they are usually members of the University of Waterloo community. They could be postdocs, they could be faculty members, they could be staff members. We've ha found that a lot of staff members really enjoy this competition and they love being involved in it. Uh, sometimes we reach out to alumni as well. Um, for the finals, we try and get high-profile people from the community. Um, so they'll, you know, they may be a politician or you know, the university, some high administrator in the university or something like that. But remember, you are speaking to an audience of interested, intelligent, but n not necessarily academic people. Really, nobody knows what you should wants to ask me what you should wear. Because I think it's kind of important, right? Um, I would, well, dress, dress like this, you know? It's like you want to dress in a way that you feel really comfortable, but it also has to be professional. So for guys, if you want to wear a three-piece suit with a fancy silk tie because that's how you feel comfortable, fine. But if that is going to feel like a costume to you, then you won't be relaxed in your body and you will not perform well. But at the same time, don't show up in ripped jeans and sandals. Because the first impressions matter. You want to be taken seriously, but you want to present yourself as a competent, articulate, interesting human being who is working on interesting things. Right? But it is a professional um, exercise that has um, you know, a really outward facing public aspect to it. Are there any other questions? Then go Waterloo.